Uh, hello and, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Greg Johnston and I'm a senior, senior application specialist at Sensors and Software. Uh, today I'll be talking about the Echo Project software. And since 2012, Echo Project software has been the foundation for organizing, viewing, and analyzing GPR data and generating reports and other outputs that suit uh, the requirements of your GPR surveys. The latest software update, this is version six, was released earlier this month. We continue to improve Echo Project by adding powerful visualization tools for data analysis and reporting. I'm gonna show you some of the new features. These are the new features that I'm planning on discussing today. I put them in the order that I think they will impact users of the Echo Project software for analyzing GPR data. So we're gonna talk about photo slicer, animations, uh, automatic 3D plots, point cloud export, multimedia flags, and grid edit. First thing I wanna talk about was a feature called photo slicer. And I think this is the new feature that I'm most excited about because I think it will have the most impact on our users. So photo slicer, as hopefully you can see in this image, allows the user to overlay a GPR depth slice image onto a photograph. So here's an example that shows archaeology data. The depth slice, if you look at the depth slice, you can see the outline of a building. So those are the foundation walls of a building. And notice how showing the depth slice on a photograph of the GPR site is a powerful way of communicating to others what the GPR discovered in the subsurface. I think an image like this, although um, not too many people are used to looking at GPR and GPR data in its raw format, like cross sections, uh, those are difficult to look at with all the wiggly lines and banding and things like that, uh, or hyperbolas for that matter. But here you've got it, you've got GPR data processed into a depth slice image and a map view, which people are very used to looking at. So it wouldn't take a lot to train somebody and say, look, you know, the look at this image, the, the strong reflectors that we're seeing in the subsurface are in reds, the weak reflectors are in blues, and the images or the reflections in between are in the colors in between, sort of the yellows and, and oranges. And to me, this is a very powerful image. Now, the key part of Photo Slicer is that it allows you to stretch or squeeze the depth slice to fit onto the photo in the proper position and with the proper perspective. So let me show you a live example of, of doing this. So if I go to, if I open up Echo Project here, so I've got depth slices here. And if I use the slider bar, you can scroll through and you see a bunch of objects, red objects. And so those are all, all, all our depth slices. Now, this is forensics data from a test site. And we've created the depth slices for this, this grid, which is 10 meters by 13 meters. So now we wanna superimpose the depth slices onto a photograph of the survey site. So what we do is we select the new photo slicer button on the menu now on the toolbar at the top. There's an, now an option called photo slicer. I go into here and I've, there's two things I've got to I've got to select. I've got to select the name of the depth slice, and I, in this particular data set I've got two, so I'm going to pick the one that I want. And then the second thing is I need to pick the photograph. Now. Regular users of Echo Project will know that we can attach photographs to your GPR project. And we call those attachments. So one of your options for finding a photograph is go to the attachments of the project and pick one of those photographs. The other option is to just pick a, a, a photograph that's outside on, on your uh, computer. So that's actually what I'm gonna do in this case. So rather than using the attachments, I'm gonna to go to files, I'm gonna to go to browse, and I'm gonna find the data set. And so this is for this one, and I'm gonna pick this photograph. 
And now that I've got the depth slice I want and the photograph that I want, I'm going to hit OK. OK, so here's what we've got. Now we see the depth slice uh, on the photo. And the next task is to place the depth slice on the photo by dragging the corners to the correct location on the photo. Now, the best way to position the depth slice on the photo is if the corners of the survey grid are visible in the photo. In this example, the tape measures indicate the corners of the grid. But you can also imagine having cones or flags that show the corners of the grid. After you have the depth slice positioned the way you want, so let's position it. So I do that by grabbing the corners. So I'll grab this corner and I'll drag it over here and I'll put it on top of that corner on the tape measure. Grab this corner, do the same thing on the far edge here. Now this corner here, you'll, you'll notice the red dot in the corner actually has a zero on it. And that's indicating the zero, zero corner. That is the X equals zero, Y equals zero corner of the grid. And then I drag this one and I put them all on. So now that is sitting in its proper perspective. And now to make it a bit prettier, I can go here and I can turn off the corners and I can turn off the frame. And so now it looks like the depth slice is sitting right on the photograph. And then over here on the right hand side, we have the slider bar, the scroll bar here. And that allows me to slice down through the depth slices and show each one in the context on the photograph. And I'll point out it's kind of small, um, but over here in the corner, you can see that it's actually got the depth. The depth of the depth slice is shown. So I'm at, I'm at 0.3 meters and this one's 0 0.35, 0 0.4 and so on. So I'm slicing down and if I find an image that I really like and want to um, keep and maybe add to a report. So I would, I would pick this one. I'm looking for, you know, theoretically as a forensic investigator, I'm looking for a body size object buried in the ground. And so here I'm getting a strong response of a larger object. And so that may be something that I wanna save. So once I have the image I like, I go to file and I've got a number of ways of saving it. I can go to edit and I can copy it to the clipboard and then I can copy this image into a Word document or, or some other document, just cutting and pasting from the clipboard. The other option is to go to file and go to export the photo slice. And if I do that, it will save this image as a JPEG. I also have the option to export all photo slices which means it will actually save all of them. Now I'm not gonna select on this because it does take a minute for it to save all those images. So I'm just gonna show you the idea of what happens there. So hopefully you get the idea of, of how this works. And to me, it's clearly a very powerful way of displaying your GPR data in the context of where it was collected. So here's what we can do with Photo Slicer as well we can take random walk, what we call random walk data and put it on a photograph. So here's an example of using that, of superimposing that type of data onto a photograph. In this example, we see the red linear response from a utility. And so this person was walking, zigzagging back and forth over this utility. And we see that strong reflector uh, appearing as a red dot, and we can kind of connect the dots and see where it's going across. So let me show you a live example of doing a random walk with Photo Slicer. If you see this data set, this is, um, if you look at the scale here, we've got, uh, this is about 65 meters across and probably about another 20, 25 meters uh, in the vertical scale here. So this is somebody went out and walked around this whole area. And we, if we slice down, you can actually see linear features appearing. So there's one here at about, here we go, at about 0.9 meters or so. We get this linear feature that's running right across. And then if we slice down deeper, I think we see another one at about 1.6 meters or so. There we go, there's the other one, very strong one in this case. So there's, you know, there's some interesting targets in this. 
So we may want to superimpose that onto a, a photograph of the site. So again, I go into Photo Slicer and I choose the depth slice. You see that I've got a whole bunch of different depth slices. So I'm going to choose the one that I want. Uh, again, I, I'm going to select the photograph. So I'm going to browse and find the photograph. And uh, here's the photograph. So here's a photo that somebody took of the site. And I hit OK. And then it is going to take a minute for it to open up in Photo Slicer. So here's the image in Photo Slicer. I'll make it. And again, you see the four corners. You see the red dots that we can grab and and put now with random walk data it's a little bit trickier because you don't necessarily have a spot in your photograph uh, or hopefully you have a spot but if you don't in this case i don't have a spot that i can um, put that corner onto so i'm going to just kind of eyeball this and place it on here so something like that looks pretty decent now, what I do want to point out is you can do some pretty funky things here. If you cross the corners, then the image will do pretty weird things on you. Um, but once you bring it back down to a reasonable shape here, it will superimpose very well onto the screen here. All right, so there's, there's our image. Uh, at this point, I can slice down through it. And I think in this particular one, we can see one of those linear features running through here. And that point, yeah, I should hit it at about 0.9. Yeah, there we go, 0.9 meters. There's one, and then I think there's another one coming through at about 1.6, there we go. So we can see it. Now, I wanna point out that what'll happen, sometimes to get it right, you may need to take the corner off the screen. And you can drag it off the screen, but as soon as you drop it, you won't be able to access it. So if I do something like this and I take the corners and I move them all off the screen, now I'm in a bit of trouble. Um, but you can always reset it. You can go to the view and you can reset the frame to the be beginning here. And so if you are going to drop it off the screen, make certain, make sure that you're in the right spot before you drop it. Otherwise, you're going to have to reset it. Okay, so you get the idea here. And again, once we're all done, we can turn off the corners, we can turn off the frame and make our, our stunning image. And then we can save either the individual photo or we can save all the, all the depth slices on the photo. So let's look at some other examples here. So here's another, here's another random walk depth slice. Now this photo was actually taken with a drone. And so they flew up above the site and took a photograph and now we're going to superimpose the data onto that. So this is actually a lot of data walking back and forth in this field. And as we slice down, you'll notice one of the things you see at first, just in the first 30 or 40 centimeters, are these circular dots in the data. And those turned out to actually be uh, tree, old tree stumps. So the, the tree isn't above the surface anymore, but the remnants of the tree are still in the subsurface and the GPR was picking that up. We're also starting to see in this same depth slice, we're starting to see some linear features running through. And that was the main target of this particular survey were the utilities that were running across the area. Now, if I continue to slice down, we start to see one appear here. And that's, that one gets to be quite bright so that's about as strong as it gets running through the area. Okay, so in each, in this case, each depth slice is 10 centimeters or about four inches thick. Okay, okay, so we've looked at an archeology span example. Uh, we looked at a forensics example and we've looked at a utility example. So let's look at some examples of using, using Photo Slicer with GPR data collected in concrete. So a four foot by four foot grid uh, with one of the depth slices superimposed onto it. Here's a eight foot by eight foot grid superimposed on the concrete. Uh, a smaller grid, I think it's a two foot by two foot grid on the ceiling. Right, Conquest system is nice and small. You can easily collect data on, on the wall or on a ceiling. So good example here. And here's one on a wall. And in this case, it's on the wall of a uh, bridge abutment. 
And so again, we're looking at the um, we're looking at the reinforcement inside the uh, the concrete. So as I hope you see, photo slicer images are powerful additions to the to the GPR report and presentations that you may make, and they convey the position of objects found with the GPR in the context of the survey site. And because of that, they're powerful way, they're powerful deliverable for your clients or your audience. Okay, let's move on to the next feature, which is animations and specifically GIF animations. So Echo Project users can now easily create GIF animation files. These animations are helpful to spot features in your data as part of the data analysis. GIF animation files are a great value add deliverable to send to your clients, along with the PDF summary report and Google Earth files. GIF animation files play on standard pre-installed Windows programs, such as Windows 10 Photo Viewer, and that makes them an easy deliverable to share with others. Animations can be made from the map view window to animate one or more depth slices with things like interpretations, the lines, the GPS path, flags. You can have all those things visible during the, um, the animation creation if you'd like. So let me show you an example of creating a GIF animation of multiple grids being sliced through simultaneously. So I'm gonna go back to that data set that I had before. Okay, so in this particular data set, there's actually uh, a bunch of grids were collected. So I'm gonna turn off the line slices and I'm gonna turn on all the grid slices. And so this is a site that we do a lot of training at. And so we, we constantly have um, people going out and collecting data on this particular site. So what I've done is I've taken a bunch of um, a bunch of the grids that they collected and I put them all together. So I just use the GPS. Uh, every time you collect a grid, it's got the GPS coordinates. So these grids were all collected and this was over a span of actually about four years at different training courses. And of course we can slice through one of the cool things about MapView is that we have all these grids, they were all processed into depth slices and we can slice through them simultaneously. And so when you see an object, uh, if I find one of these linear features running through here, you can actually see it going through multiple grids at the same time. Let me just, I'm gonna hit this one eventually. Where am I at? 65, okay, it's about 90, here we go. So you're starting to see this uh, linear feature that runs through, we can see it on this grid, through this grid, through these grids, a bit on this grid and through. So we, we see the same object on multiple grids. So I might consider that pretty cool and I wanna create a GIF animation out of it. So I simply go over to view and I say export animation. So once I select this, now I've got a couple options here. With map view, the only thing I can animate are the depth slices. So my only option is depth, but the other option is speed. How quickly do you want to, the animation to be? So I'm gonna select fast and it's gonna generate, when I hit okay, it's gonna create a frame for every depth slice here. Here's a GIF that I created earlier, just to give you an idea. So when I open that one up, so here we go. So we've got an animation slicing down, I think five, five or 10 centimeters, five centimeters at a time. I can see that in the depth scale on the top here. So now I've got a GIF file that animates the data. I can easily send that to any, uh, any customers and uh, they can play it on standard software. Okay, so besides map view, the other window that allows GIF animations to be created is the 3D preview window. And I get the impression just from talking to people that not a lot of people use the 3D preview and I'm actually a big fan of it. So I'm gonna select one of the grids here and I'm gonna to go to the 3D preview 
and it's going to open up the window. Now I'm going to I'm going to minimize the map view window so that I can maximize the size of um, the 3D preview. And 3D preview, what it is, it's essentially it's giving you three views of your grid. And the blue box here is the depth slice. And then we have the cross-sectional views. And the cross sections are whatever, uh, wherever you click on the grid, it will go to the closest two lines. So in other words, this image on the bottom here is the X line. And this is actually X line number five. And this image here is the Y line, and this is Y line number 14, okay? So anywhere you click, those two images update. And then as well, we can slice down through the depth slice in this window. And I do that by using my mouse wheel or using the scroll bar on the side here. And we see we got a nice object. Let's find a good target here. Here we go. So this object here, we see a linear feature running through, which is probably a utility. And you can see how the, the cross-section that cuts through it, if we go over here, we see that it's right at the top of this hyperbola. And the depth slice is all the data between the two red lines on, on this uh, cross-section. And so we've got that correlation between the top of the hyperbola and this red linear feature. And what this suggests is that because I've got a red linear feature going across here, it suggests that this hyperbola, I'm going to see it on all the lines across the whole grid. And if I do that, if I use the arrow keys on my keyboard, I can move that along. And you can see here that yes, as predicted, we're seeing a very consistent hyperbola. Okay, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why I really like uh, the 3D preview is because it gives you the depth slices but you always want to verify things by looking at the cross section. All right, so what you see here is that there are multiple animations that could be created from here. You could create the animation of the depth slices or the animation of the X lines or an animation of the Y lines. And so when I'm in 3D preview and I go to view and export animation, now I've got the option of what am I going to save? Am I going to, am I going to animate the X lines, the Y lines, or the depth? And do I want slow, normal, or fast? And so I'm, again, I'm not going to let it generate because it does take a minute, but I do have it on my PowerPoint slide. Here's actually the three GIF animations, one for each uh, dimension of, of the data. So this one on the left, the depth slices are being animated. Uh, the one in the middle, the X lines are being animated. And the one on the right here, the Y lines are being animated. Okay. So again, three little GIF files that I've just popped onto PowerPoint, but again, you can send those to your customer. All right, moving on. So we're through animations. So let's talk about the automatic 3D plots in Voxler. As you probably know, and what 3D previews show, when you collect GPR data in a grid, you have a 3D volume of data because you have surveyed over an area to a depth. And seeing a 3D image of your GPR results is a great way to vi visualize and analyze the data. For many years, the Echo Project SliceView module has generated 3D files that can be opened in the Voxler software. Now, Voxler is a third-party software. It's not our software. It's developed by Golden Software out of Colorado in the US. And Voxler is a very powerful program for 3D visualization. And we do sell it along with Echo Project. So Voxler is very powerful software, but one of the problems was that it, it, it does have a fairly steep learning curve. And we know that everyone's busy and don't always have time to learn new software. And so the SliceView grid module in Echo Project version six now exports in a single click the files needed to visualize your data in Voxler, essentially boosting you up the Voxler learning curve. 
So let me show you an example of this. Okay, so this is a, a different data set, but it, it does have a couple nice targets in it here. So we've got a linear feature coming right across here. And then when I go down deeper, there's actually a T-shaped utility in here. So I've got two main features running through here. Now I wanna look at those in 3D. So this is what you can do now. Go to File, Export Data to 3D. And what it does is it, it creates a 3D file. And at the same time, if you have Voxler installed on your computer, it will launch Voxler. And it will set Voxler up with some initial uh, visualizations of that data. Here's that data set now in 3D. And so I can change the size of it. I can spin it around, have a quick look at it. And what we've done is we've given you some initial views so that it's easier to manipulate the data. So you're starting at a spot where you can um, start creating some cool images uh, that you can save or animations that you can save uh, for your report or for your client. So let me talk about uh, some of those visualizations. The first one, and these ones are over here, the first one is called a volume render. And the volume render is the entire volume of the data. And we're not actually viewing the entire volume of data because we have a clip plane going on here. So I'm gonna, let me show you. So here's actually the full volume of data. And I'm gonna change it ever so slightly. I'm gonna put it into a 3D textures rather than 2D. So here's our volume of data. That's all the data over an area. So the five meters by five meters by about two meters deep. And so you'll remember that every GPR data point is an amplitude, is it's the reflection strength at that particular X, Y, Z position in the cube. And so what we can do here is we can manipulate this image by removing data of certain amplitudes. And so Voxler's got this powerful way of doing this. So I can go into this feature in here and it shows me a histogram of all the different amplitudes of the data. And I can go in here and I can manipulate the opacity of the data. So in other words, over on the right here, these are the strongest reflectors and the weaker reflectors are on the left. So if I make the weaker reflectors translucent and then ultimately invisible, then the only thing left in my data are the very strong reflectors, which in this case are the pipe and that T junction there. So now that I'm happy, if I'm happy with this image, I can come out of here and now I can look at those in 3D spin them around, I can see, okay, obviously that one's above the T one. And there's a couple other, you know, there's a few other little spots that are of high amplitude, but the dominant features are these utilities in our cube. So that's a pretty cool way of looking at the data. If I go back into here and I change the, the opacity again. So let's bring the data back. Now I can, I can use uh, this feature called uh, clip plane. And so the clip plane will cut through the cube and it will do it in any direction I want. So right now it's set up in the Z direction. So if I move this bar, it'll start slicing the data from the top. And this is just like our depth slices that we do in, in slice view. But it also allows me to change the angle of this. So I could, I could now slice in the other direction. Let me slice in the Y direction here. And if I do that, now I'm slicing the data this way. Let me turn that around so I can move this back and forth and I can slice this way. I can even slice at a 45 degree angle. So if I do this, now I've got this funky direction here and I can slice like that. And I can do it at all three angles if I want. And I can slice at 45 degrees at all angles. So you can do some pretty cool things with the data slicing through it. Okay, so that is, that is volume render. 
volume renders the entire volume and clip plane allows you to cut through that volume at different angles. And the other type of display that I want to talk about is this one called ISO surface. ISO means the same. So we're looking at all the signals in the data that are of the same value. And so I've turned that on. And if I go to the ISO surface, again, I can, I can play around with that value and change it. If I go to a very small value, I'm going to see a whole bunch of things in the, in the data cube that have that value. But as I go to the higher amounts, there's not as much data that has a higher high amplitudes and the pipes are those. So if I stop here, now I've got a combination of a volume render and an ISO surface. And the thing that's pretty cool is if you look at the pipe, we can actually look down the length of the pipe. Let me turn off the volume render. So I can actually so the, the processing is so good that it collapses the hyperbola that you normally see from a utility. It collapses it into a point target. And in this case, we're actually able to look down the length of that, that pipe. We're not doing it in reality. So hopefully you agree that um, you know, these three ways of looking at the data and just in, in 3D in general is, is a powerful way of looking at, at uh, GPR data. And so the big, the big feature change here is getting that initial image up here. So you don't have to uh, play around. You don't have to learn how to use Voxler quite as much and you've got boosted up the learning curve. Okay, the fourth topic is uh, point cloud export. Now, GPR data files can get very large. We now have customers who are routinely collecting data over acres or hectares and collecting billions of sample points. Manipulating, displaying, and analyzing these enormous data sets can be challenging. Further, it's not uncommon for GPR data to be one sensor in a multi-sensor survey. Think of archaeologists who collect GPR data, but then they also collect magnetic data at the same time. Or you have subsurface utility engineers collecting GPR data, but also 3D laser scan data. So we have now given the ability to export the GPR data into a, what's called a point cloud data format. And point cloud software has become popular for plotting very large scientific data sets. The software was originally developed for LIDAR data, 3D laser scans, and photogametry. Point cloud visualization software obviously is a useful tool for visualizing GPR data collected with GPS. And that's actually what I've got in this example in here. You can see that this is a GPR line where somebody snaked back and forth across an area and we can look at it in what's called a fence diagram. So we're looking at it as the cross section and we can see the hyperbolic responses for a couple objects through here that are running through linearly. And those are you know, some sort of utilities obviously. And now with Echo Project version six, it's very simple to export GPR data into a point cloud format. So let me show you how easy that is. So I'm going to take the same data set. I'm just going to use the same one here. So here's the, the, the path of this. And so if I want to export that to point cloud, I just check the line name over here in Project Explorer. And then I go to File, Export. And we've had exports of, of data ever since the beginning of Echo Project. And, but now we've got a new one under Lines, which is now called Point Cloud. So we have other formats you can export into SegY, DT1, CSV, text files. Uh, but now you can export to one called Point Cloud. And I won't, again, it'll take a second. If, if I click this, it does take a second to save it. But I want to show you what will happen after you've saved it. Okay, so I've got a piece of software here called Cloud Compare. And Cloud Compare is a free viewer. It's a free point cloud software. And so I'm going to open that file. And let's do a quick look at this. So it brings the data in. 
And basically we have a big file that has X, Y, Z, and amplitude. That's what our GPR cube really consists of. And the only thing I have to tell it at this point is that skip the first line that's defining what, the, what each column is. So skip that, apply to all. It'll tell me, okay, um, wanna manipulate that, just say yes. And so now it's generated, now here's our data. So it's as quick as that. Now it's plotted in green, which I don't quite like, but I can easily go in here and scroll down to all the properties and I can change the color. So if I go in and decide, well, I really like grayscale for looking at GPR data. So I'm gonna to switch to gray and I'm gonna make this a bit bigger. And so now you see, you can spin it around. You can have a look at it in every angle. Now, one of the things you're gonna notice is that there, it's kind of, um, you can see through it right now. And so probably what I'm going to, what I wanna do is I wanna change the point size. So each, each point on here is a certain size. So I, I can increase that. You can see as soon as I make it one point larger, now a lot of those disappear. If I make it two points larger, pretty much everything disappears. So now we can see, we can see the GPR data as a solid fence diagram. And then I can go in and I can manipulate um, the color scheme or what's shown here. So let me do that. And so I can make this look pretty good actually. And I am by no means an expert in point cloud software. Um, I watched a couple videos to, to learn how to do this stuff, but it is pretty straightforward once you've used it once or twice. And I'm sure there's powerful tools in here for doing all kinds of really cool things. Okay. So here's an example of what one of our customers has done. So they've combined 3D laser scanning of above the surface. So this is a point cloud um, above the surface. So it's showing objects and roads and um, you know, trees and everything that's above the surface. And then the blue and green at the bottom here is the, um, is the GPR data. So we essentially have an image of this, what's above the surface and the GPR is providing information about what's below the surface. So pretty powerful stuff. And we see definitely a lot of technologies going this way. You, you're gonna wanna be able to see these uh, multi-sensor data sets in one view. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is multimedia flags. And hopefully you're familiar with the idea of adding flags to your data. If not, let me watch this video and let me talk about it for a second. Flags are added to GPR data in the field by pressing the star button on the data logger. They can also be added in Echo Project during post-processing. The idea is to mark the position of surface features or objects in the GPR data to assist with data interpretation or positioning. An example is shown in this video. Here we're flagging the position where the GPR system moves from one type of surface material to a different type. In this case, we're going from grass to pavement and then from pavement onto grass because surface materials can affect the GPR response and ultimately impact the interpretation of the data. And you see in this example that the subsurface penetration depth and responses are very different between the flags when the GPR system is on the asphalt. There's a change in the penetration depth when you're on top of the asphalt for whatever reason. Now this is useful information for the data interpreter who may not be the one who collected the data. So flags are a great way of communicating this information. So now what we have is Echo Project version six adds a new feature to the interpretation module, a thing called multimedia flags, which combines flags and multimedia attachments. So Echo Project already allows GPR users to attach auxiliary data files, such as photos, videos, and audio files, and field notes to the project. But 
the problem in the past was associating them with a very with a specific location in the data could not be done. Now with the new multimedia flags feature, we can we can actually associate a video or a photo or a audio file with a flag in a particular data set. So let's look at an example here. So using the photo flag. So what's happened is we attached a photograph to the flag. And so now when somebody's looking at the data, they can simply click on the picture of the flag and it will open the multimedia associated with it. In this case, a photograph. So they, they click on this and say, okay, why did uh, whoever collected the data associated this photo? Oh, they took a photo of the spot where they were collecting the data. Okay. And similarly, we have the video flag. And in the video flag, you click, it opens the video and you can watch the video associated with it. So multimedia flags provide an easy way to transfer information from the field back to the interpreter at a specific location in your data. So by attaching helpful photographs, videos, voice recordings onto your data, it also provides a complete archive of your results to be used when analyzing your data. And remember that any files attached to a GPR project are saved in the GPZ project file. So the whole project with all the information and all the attachments are saved in a single file. That makes it easy to distribute and easy to archive. The last thing I want to talk about is grid edit. And we now have the ability to edit a grid inside of the Echo Project software. If you ever collect data with a sensors and software GPR system, you notice that there's two types of data collection, line scans and grid scans. And for various reasons, GPR grid data often needs to be edited. Let me give you some common situations that occur. You collected several grids over a large area. So you've broken a large area down into multiple grids. But now that you're done, you want to process them all together. So you want to combine grids and make a super grid for processing. So you can do that with grid edit. Or you need to correct a mistake made in the field. You told the software that you were collecting all your grid lines in the same forward direction, but you actually collected it by zigzagging, by going forward and then reverse, collecting the data forward and reverse. And then you get back and you realize, oh no, my depth slices look like dog's breakfasts. And then you realize, oh, you know what? I told the software I was going all in the same direction, but I didn't. So now I need to fix that. And you can do that with this new grid edit. The other one is, and we run into this all the time, is people go out and they collect a bunch of line scans. So they collect a bunch of parallel line scans and then they decide, oh, you know what? I wanna look at this as a grid and they need to convert from line scans to a grid scan. And again, you can do that with this new grid edit capability. So let me show you a few of these examples quickly and I can show you how, how easy it is to do that. Okay, so say for example, we have the parallel line situation. So somebody's gone out and they've collected line zero to line 10 and they're all parallel to one another, but in Echo Project, they're considered just a line set and the folder is just a folder for a line set. And we see nothing in map view because there's no positional information about these lines. And so we want to convert them to a grid. So we check all the names that we want to include in the grid. We right click on the folder name and we say, I want to create a grid from the lines that are checked. That's what I want to do. So I cl click on that. It opens it up and it, it asks me a few questions. Okay what direction are these lines running? Which way did you collect them? In the X direction or the Y direction? And I'm gonna pick the X direction. And then I need to know how far apart are those lines? What was, the, what was the spacing between the lines? 
And in this case, I have it's half a meter. And I have the option of offsetting it from the origin, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to set it at the zero, zero corner. And when I hit OK, boom, it takes all those lines. It makes them parallel X lines. And that's exactly what I want. And I close this off. And then you'll see that when Echo Project opens back up, I'll now have a grid that I can look at. OK, so now you see those lines have been turned into a grid. And so now we have two data sets. We have the original lines that were considered a line set. Now we have this new one called, it's still called line set, but it has the grid symbol on it. And these are actually a grid. And so I would be able to take this into slice view and slice view grid and turn it into depth slices, which hopefully you understand that process. So I'm not gonna do that right now. Okay, the next type of grid editing I might wanna do is combining two grids. So I may be in this situation where I, uh, somebody went out and collected two five meter grids and this second grid actually needs to go on top of the first grid. So they wanna take the two grids and combine them together. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna check all the lines in grid number two and then we're gonna right click on grid number one and we have this option called add checked lines to selected grid. That's what I wanna do. I wanna add the two grids together. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to, the, the only thing I really need to tell them is what is the spacing between the lines? Cause it doesn't know that. And now I also, actually I also need to tell it where is this grid going with respect to the first grid? So the first grid was at the zero, zero corner, and this one is gonna be on top of it. So it's gonna be at X equals zero, Y equals five. That's where I'm gonna put the, the corner. So when I hit okay, I get a little warning in here, which is still okay. And now the two grids have been put together. And so you can see them on top of one another and it put it up here. And so now I have grid one is now this super grid. It's a combination of grid one and grid two. And so now what I'm gonna end up doing is taking grid two and saying, okay, I don't need this one anymore. And so I can delete it. And so now I just have the super grid. I have the two grids that have been combined into one. And so you see how simple that is. And if you have multiple grids that you need to jigsaw puzzle together, you can just keep going through the process until everything is done, till they're all together. Let me show you the last one. This is the situation where I told the software I was running all the lines straight, but I actually zigzagged. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm highlighting every second line and in particular every odd line so that I can change the direction of them. So I'm going through and I'm picking all the Y lines, all the odd ones. Okay, and now I can go into the little editor and all, what I wanna do is change the orientation. And the orientation change is I'm gonna flip the start and end positions. And boom, it's done. Hit okay, I look, I see the arrowheads are in the different direction and that's exactly what I want. And back in here, that's, what I, that's the correction I wanted to make to my data because of the mistake made out in the field. Okay. So hopefully you can see that we've now added some useful tools for people who collect and process grid data. All right, and so thank you guys very much for your time. Certainly, if you have questions, don't be shy, contact us. The easiest way is actually through the website. If you go to the website and go to uh, the box where you contact us, thank you very much for your, your time and your attention.